So um, in this talk, I'm going to kind of assume that uh, you know everything about uh, CACTA LTV, net dollar retention, a magic number. You heard it so many times, you can kind of recite it in your sleep. And uh, really focus a little bit more on, I think, what uh, some insights that I've kind of taken from, from being in the field and, and seen uh, a lot of fundraisers over the years. Uh, if sort of CAC to LTV, net dollar retention, and, and magic number doesn't sound familiar to you, there are plenty of resources to kind of read up on that uh, online. Uh, but I would recommend maybe start with uh, Point Nine's uh, funding napkin and, and, and take it from there. Uh, so, uh, and then at the end, we'll kind of hear from, from May and Gideon and, and see, you know, compare some notes and see what actually worked to get uh, international VCs across the line. So uh, the first thing point I wanted to, to bring up today is, is what I call uh, balancing the short term and the long term. Um, and so essentially, uh, short term, uh, what do I mean by short term? So short term, I think about uh, kind of the metrics, what's going to happen the, the next 6 to 12 to 18 months, uh, you know, really focusing down on, on the nitty gritty uh, versus long term tends to be uh, more about strategy and uh, uh, the vision and kind of, you know, competitive dynamics as well as the quality of the product. And uh, investors often tend to focus more on one thing or the other. Uh, usually it depends on uh, their situation. Essentially, you know, are they uh, a seed fund or a multi-stage fund? Like what's kind of their uh, drive and incentives? And uh, figuring this out is, is quite critical in order to address the concerns uh, of the investor. So, uh, you know, as an example, if you're a seed investor you're pro and you do seed only, like your main focus is, is more likely than not going to be, okay, what are the metrics you need to hit in order to get to Series A? So, you know, if you raise this $3 million round, you know, where does that get us in 12, 18 months? Uh, versus if you're a multi-stage fund, you might, you're probably thinking much more about kind of, all right, what does this look like five to seven years out from now? So, you know, who are the competitors? What's kind of the big vision, the big strategy? How do I know that this is going to create a great company and, and a big outcome? And navigating this is, is kind of is critical uh, in, in talking to the people that you do meet. And so, um, ideally, you want to read the investor and kind of understand you know, what they're, like how they're thinking, where their head's at, and steer the pitch in that, in that direction. And this is not, you know, a super easy thing to do. Uh, it's something, it's a skill that gets developed over time as, as, you, as you have more and more of these meetings. Uh, but there's certainly things you can do in order to kind of suss it out and, and get there faster. And so I think, uh, as an example, allowing ample room for questions, uh, I think, is pretty critical. And if you do that, you'll see that every question, typically in a fundraising meeting, has a, has a, has a meaning behind it. There's, you know, there's a reason that question is being asked, and they're staring uh, towards one of their concerns or one of the things they don't fully understand. And uh, if you can identify that and kind of address that, either in the meeting or in the follow-up, then that really is going to set you apart. That's kind of part of what's going to get you across the line, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, and uh, the other way of doing this, which is you know, becoming uh, increasingly difficult, but also increasingly more important, is to try to develop a relationship with the potential investors ahead of time. So before you actually um, are raising, or in the round before, and then meet again, and uh, investors are very interested in, in chatting and understanding and getting updates about your company and how things are developing for you uh, over time. Uh, it's important for us as well to get to know you, the team, and kind of invest in lines, not, not dots, as, as, we, as we call it. And um, I think so. every kind of interaction should be an opportunity for you to, to develop that and, and kind of start learning more about the VC, what their concerns are, and how they think. Uh, as an example, I wanted to, to bring up a PropTech SaaS company that I was working on 
uh, a year, year and a half ago, or two years ago, I don't know, well, time, time flies. Uh, and so, um, which essentially uh, where we did a round with both the seed investor on board and a multi-stage investor. And uh, so, you know, the seed investor done a pre-seed round of 500K, and we're now raising a seed round of like three to four million. And seed investor brought to the table a very kind of defined set of, of uh, focus. So really brought the founder in to focus on the next six to 12 months versus the multi-stage investor, which we brought on board was, um, did not care so much about that. It was much more uh, about buying into the vision, uh, buying into the long-term thinking, understanding how what this could be beyond kind of you know a prop tech SaaS company like what can you do with the data what can you do with how can you upsell the clients how do you compete against the others and um, we actually did the C round together uh, and then this company ended up raising multiple rounds from the same multi-stage fund so you know there is a 10 million series A and a 50 million dollar series B all from the same investor who had bought into this kind of long-term vision uh, so, thought I'd mention that as an example of, of, of how, dif how different the approaches are and, and uh, how you need to cater to, to each one and how beneficial it can be to have both of those uh, uh, perspectives on board. All right, so um, the second thing I wanted to talk about is around telling your story. Uh, with cohorts uh, and how crucial cohort analysis is um, and so uh, and how by if you're just showing up with the cohort analysis you're probably getting put your head of like 60 percent of the field today at least um, so if you're not familiar with cohort analysis uh, a cohort is essentially uh, a group of customers that signed up at the same time uh, at, uh, in a certain time interval. So that's usually in a month or in a quarter or in a year, uh, say. So, uh, and what you can do with cohort analysis is, uh, so you look at each cohort over time in the journey and you can compare them at the same point in the journey. So instead of comparing everybody in May 2021, you're comparing uh, companies uh, or your cohorts across month zero, month one, month two, month three. And this is uh, really, really powerful uh, for a number of different ways, uh, for a number of different reasons. It really uh, shows you a lot about how the business is evolving over time, if the company as a whole is improving, you know, if customers are really receptive to the changes and iterations you do on the product, uh, all sorts of stuff, uh, which, is, which is fantastically helpful. And uh, I think, and every cohort tells a story, essentially. You know, it's kind of like a journey over time. You see uh, how long people stayed, they, you know, how many people churned, what was the kind of usage pattern and revenue expansion inside of a cohort. And that story might be obvious to you because you live and breathe it every day, but it's not always obvious to the audience uh, or uh, to the investors. You know, so things that could kind of really affect the cohorts on a day-to-day, -day, so like a new product launch, you know, a new, like, or maybe some customers went bankrupt and you have higher churn than normal. Uh, or, you know, if you're trying to tell the story of how You, you break into the company, and once everybody understands how great your product is, the really uh, adoption just follows and, and explodes. Uh, and so this context over time uh, is really what makes uh, core analysis so special. Uh, you know, and it really tells us both about the business getting better, but also about how well you can kind of predict the future. Because if you have consistency in the cohorts uh, in terms of pattern and how things uh, are going, you can actually really well get or get a really great picture of the future, essentially. Um, and so, as an example for this, I wanted to bring up uh, Klarna 
you know, which is probably the next $50 billion company out of the Nordics. Uh, I know it's not a SaaS company, uh, but uh, it has publicly available data, uh, and it is also, the point is still the same. Uh, and, uh, and it's a really kind of valuable example of this. So if you look at the latest uh, investor materials and annual report of Klarna, you'll see that in a new Klarna customer will use uh, Klarna like one to three times in year zero. So sort of the year it is, I know. And, but then something very, very interesting happens. So in year nine, no, sorry, in year one, people started using Klarna nine times per year. So, you know, almost once every month. In year three, people are using Klarna 14 times per year. And then in year seven, people are using, the people who still stay are using Klarna 27 times uh, per year. You know, so pretty dramatic uh, kind of pattern of improvement and really shows you, A, why Klarna is, is so uh, valuable uh, <laughs> and, and B, you know, it's such an incredible insight for the early, early investors and for people still investing to this day that why this is valuable. Because now you know that whenever Klarna acquires a customer, if you can get that customer to hang on for seven years, like they're going to be using you 27 times a year. And this pattern has actually been consistent. If you look at all the cohorts, it's been consistent for, for, for seven years. They all follow more or less the same pattern and even across geographies. And so you can get some really powerful insights out of uh, showing cohorts this. Yep. Yes, I can. Sorry. And so for the last one, um, it's to kind of address the metrics and own the narrative. So if you could, um, so even if your, your metrics don't necessarily look as great as you would hope they would, you know, we live in the real life, please get ahead. Uh, get out ahead of it, address it in the meetings, it's going to come up. And if you can kind of own it, explain the situation and steps taken, then that's going to be uh, tremendous for, uh, for building the trust with investors. Cool. Uh, so thank you. So that was uh, sort of uh, the three points that I want to drive home uh, today. Uh, so uh, sort of balancing the long term and the short term, uh, telling your story with cohorts and kind of addressing the metrics and so on the narrative. Now, um, I think it's time to introduce a couple of good friends of mine, uh, May and Gideon.